Welcome, everyone. We have two very distinguished European statesmen with us, the Foreign Minister of, of Finland, the Finance Minister of Sweden, um, to discuss what is really a central historical issue that I think most people haven't realized how central and how historical it is. So I'm going to ask you, uh, Minister Danberg, Sweden has been neutral for 200 years, maybe more. Um, this is a big deal. Give us a sense of do Swedes think of it in those historical terms? This is a break with centuries of neutrality? I think you have to understand that Sweden has been non-aligned for 200 years. Last time we were at war was the, the Napoleon Wars. That brings some perspectives to it. So, so no ordinary family in Sweden has experienced war themselves. They have, might have contacts with Finland, with other countries. People have fled to Sweden with the experience of war, but Sweden itself has not experienced war. So for us, the non-aligned politics has been very pragmatic. It's been a way of not getting involved in, in war. So for us, changing these policies is quite big. It's a huge thing. It's a generation of Swedes that have grown up. It has not been the same for 200 years, but still basically had a, a, a political position not getting involved and, and being non-aligned. So, but it has changed. Uh, the, the last couple of decades, we've joined the European Union. We have a broad cooperation, not least with Finland, our closest ally, but also uh, very strong partnership with NATO. So, of course, this has changed over the years, but uh, this is a big historic event for Sweden. And for you, this Russian aggre aggression tells you you're in a new world, you're in a new security environment. Uh, yes, totally a new world and also we think it's a long-term change. It's not just the war right now. This is a new Russia, this is a new environment. Uh, so f for many Swedes I think th this really brought the debate to a different level. Uh, so we had a debate in Sweden but it was quite cautious, it was quite respectful. You could have different opinion but in the end most people, the population, but most political parties agreed this was the time to see that we are more secure within NATO than outside NATO, and we want to go hand in hand with Finland. Uh, Mr. Havisto, um, tell us from Finland's point of view, you also have a long history here, and it's been one where you've been very careful not to provoke the Russians because you share that border in a in a way, you're almost a suburb of, uh, of St. Petersburg. Uh, what, what made you change? Well, of course, we have 1,300 kilometer common border, and, and we want to maintain that uh, border peaceful. And how we in Finland think about Russia is, is long perspective also. We look 100 year backwards and 100 year forward. And when we look backwards from the Tsar time, Lenin and Stalin, after Stalin, Rutschev, then after Rutschev to turn to Brezhnev, then from Brezhnev to Gorbachev and Yeltsin, and then to Putin. And we have seen, we have been witnessing all these changes. So we have a neighbor that has been performing quite a big political changes, even in the last years. And when we look towards the future, we don't know what's coming after Putin. Is it something better, more democratic, or is it something worse? And we have to be prepared for all different scenarios of, of Russia. And we have had actually, uh, this has maybe a difference with Sweden, that we have had in our security white paper since I think 2004, this kind of what we call a NATO option. That means that if security uh, uh, environment changes around the Baltic Sea area, we might consider applying NATO. And now it's the question that has it been changing enough? And, and we think that, you know, when Russia by military force tries to change a government and a leadership of the 40 million country, Ukraine, in, in the neighborhood. This is a major change also in our security environment. And that made the f fundaments that we, we decided to, to apply for the NATO membership. D Russia's immediate reaction was to threaten you and then to cut off energy. Um, do, you, do you worry that there will be more Russian actions? Well, our feeling is that, well, yes, Russia did not like the, the idea that there's an enlargement of NATO, and particularly that NATO is coming closer uh, with the Finnish border, Finnish-Russian border, and so forth. There were critical comments on that. But at the same time, I, my understanding is that uh, it didn't trigger any military action against Finland or Sweden. It, it might 
trigger something on cyberspace or on hybrid uh, formats and so forth. But uh, of course, we have been all the time saying that we are not provoking. We want to keep the border peaceful. We want to give, keep the bilateral cooperation what is needed even in these circumstances on the border on the professional basis. Um, what about what, how do you feel about that? You know, the Russians have been saying, uh, as Minister Havisto says, uh, NATO is being provocative. It's moving closer and closer to us. This doubles NATO's border with Russia. Um, is there something to that? To the idea that NATO is being uh, is is moving eastward in a way that threatens Russia? No, uh, we wouldn't have this discussion if uh, Russia wouldn't have invaded Ukraine then the discussion wouldn't have been there in Finland and Sweden. This is a reaction on Russians' way of acting in Europe. Uh, they made that choice and that made us as sovereign states. Uh, we make our own security decisions. Uh, we're not dictated from Moscow. We make our own security arrangements. And now with this environment, we find that we are more secure inside than outside uh, and made this uh, uh, change in our history and our perspective. But so I, I, you can't use that argument. I, I think it's not valid because Russia invaded Ukraine. You, were you, was Swedish neutrality in part because of your relationship with Finland? I would say not, not the whole question because we, we have a very pragmatic uh, um, history on this, trying to avoid being involved in wars, but the Finnish History is important for us. Sweden and Finland was the same country. Not, not, we were the same country for hundreds of years. My mother comes from Finland. Uh, actually, um, she came to Sweden first time when she was four years old. She fled when Russia, uh, Soviet Union, bombed Helsing Force, Helsinki. Uh, and she this was... Uh, 1939. 1939. She, uh, my, my grandfather was killed in the war. Uh, and uh, my mother was sent to Sweden alone when she was four years old, taking care of, of a Swedish family. A lot of war children came to Sweden. This is my history. So we, we, this is part, we, we belong to each other in a special sense. And we have also created a, a unique um, security arrangement between Finland and Sweden, uh, planning, uh, working together in, in a most advanced way. So for us, the Finnish decision was also important because we didn't want to separate from Finland in, in a security arrangement system because that would also hurt our security. So for us going together was, was one part of the argument. Finland has had a war with Russia and uh, what lessons did you take, what, what lessons has Finland taken from that? I think there are many lessons and, and it might be that the different People have different lessons from, from that, but f first of all, I think the lesson, or first lesson is that you have to defend yourself. You, now we are hearing uh, from Russia that when Ukraine is defending themselves, they are prolonging the war. Uh, we feel a little bit guilty. We also prolonged the winter war a little bit by defending ourselves. But, In 1941. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, and, and, and 30, 39 when Russia was attacking us, and 1940 when peace was made. But I think it's, it's, uh, that is our recommendation, of course, to Ukraine. You have to defend yourself. Mm. We, we can help you, but it's, it's your responsibility. The second lesson is probably that, that we have feel a certain time respect by Russia on, on, on that. People say that Russia uh, respects uh, when, when you are powerful and so forth. Of course, as a small nation, we are maybe not so powerful, but, but I, I think there has been a certain respect in our relations. People are actually asking that why didn't you apply NATO when Russia made its tricks in Georgia 2008, or why didn't you apply NATO when, when the 2014 happened in Crimea, the occupation. I think the, the, we are totally on another level of violence totally other level of behavior of Russia at the, at the moment. And, and uh, Russia was well calculating maybe 2008 and 2014. Now they are ready to take huge risks, losing their own soldiers, losing their material in the war against uh, Ukraine. This looks very scary. And, and also I, I, I think the, the issue of the nuclear weapons, tactical nuclear weapons have been I would say, ever discussed in Europe that somebody would, would use this type of weapons. And people at the street stop me and ask, hey, Pekka, we have a, we have a good military force. We have 280,000 in our reserve. But what do we do if we are threatened by tactical nuclear weapons? This is a new type of phenomena. So, so let me ask you about that, because you, your government, and your president in particular knows Putin very well. 
And I think many of us, I, I've met him several times, I always thought he was calculating, rational. Always seemed to me very anti, uh, certainly anti-American and in some ways anti-Western. But now you seem to see somebody who is emotional. The, it's difficult to understand what cost-benefit analysis took place here. Russia is suffering huge costs for seemingly very, very little benefit. Do you think Putin has changed? Uh, of course, you can you can have a speculation on this psychology, but but uh, the issue is also it might be that that your decisions are based on the wrong information that the intelligence in in, in uh, Russia didn't work properly, or or people wanted to feed up to the leadership something that that maybe the leadership wants to hear. Uh, this is something we don't know. It's actually up to the historians then to find out what really happened. But this is surprising also from our perspective to take such risks and, and come to the situation where you are cornered the whole, almost the entire world against you. This is not certainly a calculated risk. And, and I, 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 I think how to get out of this is very complicated because there are, of course, uh, those who want to now find a peaceful way, then some people who say we, without this, with this regime we cannot find a peaceful solution. I hope still the, there's a chance for the peace because sooner or later, of course, some kind of negotiations have to be there. What do you think about that? You know, the, the Italians uh, reportedly have put forward a proposal that says, look, let's find a way to start um, negotiating an end to this conflict. Uh, Ukraine declares no neutrality, Crimea and the Don Donbass uh, remain in essentially Russian control, but they have to withdraw from certain territories. Do you think that we, are, we, we should be moving in that direction? I think we should be very careful for, for putting these arguments uh, to another people that are under attack. Uh, our, our response now must be to be support, uh, supportive and solidaric with Ukraine. Um, of course, there might be a time where the Ukrainian leadership comes to a conclusion and wants to make a decision. But it's very clear that they should have our backing all the time because Ukraine didn't do wrong. They defended themselves and they have the right to their territory under international law. So I think, of course, there might be a time where there will be a diplomatic or a political solution to the question. But this does not take away the responsibility from the Russians. And I think the international community should be very careful to put that pressure on Ukraine. Do you think Europe can continue and even expand the economic pressure on Russia? Or is, are there going to be voices in Europe saying, look, we're paying too high a price for all this? I think, first of all, this has been unique unity uh, among Europe and together with the US. As a, I, I just remember six months ago, everyone or, or a year ago, everyone was talking about Europe being splitting up. Will EU survive uh, the, the split within? And, and when I came as Minister of Finance to my first meeting, talking about the sanctions, leader after leader, uh, Minister of the Minister said, we will not bring out our calculator now. We will have to make uh, substantial uh, sanctions on Russia. And we managed to put five packages so far. I think we will come to a six package, uh, and that will be very important. And it is historical, uh, although, um, for us, it's very important to say that for Sweden, we are not linked to the energy system with Russia in any way. So for us, it's very easy to have a very principled uh, position. Uh, but we also see that some countries in Europe are very linked to, to their energy system to Russia. That's a different situation. And we have to find a way of getting rid of, rid of this. So I think this is a very also relevant security policy issue to actually not talking only about climate when we talk about energy, but actually talk about this as a, a new argument for, for making uh, uh, an energy transition and away from uh, fossil fuels. Uh, what happens if the Russians continue to just cut energy off from Finland? Can you, can you handle it? But actually, we, we can handle it. We have been all the time calculating that if the gas, like now if there was a cut of the nature gas, and if the electricity connection will be cut, we have an alternative for that. That's part of our planning. The, the issue, actually, in some European countries is that uh, households are connected to uh, Russian gas. 
and when you cut the you know the gas from the kitchen or the heating or, or so it's it's affecting directly to the people we have actually majority of, of those users are from the industry and, and we can replace the, the gas and we have made arrangements the LNG ship is coming to Finland and, and so forth and we have the Baltic connector which is now helping us a little bit we invested to that so it's a it, it has been uh, planned, and, but I, I fully agree that, that this is the moment for the green transition, actually mm. giving this kind of foreign policy reasons mm. also for, for this and, and doing the climate things a little bit, little bit ahead. And, and this is something where Europe has probably been a little bit weak to coordinate the energy systems earlier, and now comes the moment of truth, yeah. that you have to find ways to, to survive without this Russian gas, Russian oil. And, I also actually agree what you said that that how united Europe has been has been a surprise. It has been united on on sanction issues so far, and it has been united to send uh, even weapons to Ukraine. And I, I think I, I, European Union has really done its role at this crisis. All right, um, we are talking about membership in uh, NATO as if it is uh, essentially fait accompli, and certainly that is how um, the Secretary General of NATO talks about it. That is how. The President of the United States talks about it, but there is one NATO country that does not talk about it that way, and that is Turkey. Um, the President of Turkey has made clear, in his view, this is not going to happen. Um, he accuses both your governments of harboring terrorists, by which he means Kurdish separatists. How big a stumbling block is this? Of course, all NATO countries have the possibility of, of putting their opinions on in this process, and there are three, four moments when you can when you can uh, pull the brake and, 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 and push the brake and, and so forth. So it's a, it's it's a like a, a situation where you really have to answer to all questions, which whichever NATO country has, and this is where we are now. I have had a very good cooperation with the Turkish Foreign Minister, my colleague Minister Sabusoglu. I have been visiting Turkey twice this spring, and, and, and we have had uh, many, many telephone calls on a variety of subjects, including, by the way, the, the, the Turkish role in, in Ukraine, uh, Russia, so probably solving the conflict. So they are, they are doing a lot on, on that front. But, uh, but now it's, of course, our time to convince that our legislation is appropriate regarding the PKK and so forth. PKK is also forbidden organization, terrorist organization on the European level, and that is it's, it's also in Finland and Sweden, so no doubt about that. Our delegations, first diplomatic delegations, will be in Ankara tomorrow and, and on Wednesday, and, and, and this debate will continue. But of course, time frame is very difficult to decide because it's, uh, it's uh, up then to Turkey also in what timetable things can move. Are you confident that you... Uh, sure, let's, uh, let's, let's, let me ask this. Swedish minister to respond to the same thing, and then we can. Um, do you think the Turkish objections will be uh, will be dealt with? I hope uh, we will reach a conclusion. Uh, uh, we had uh, initial contacts with all 30 membership com com countries, and there were positive signals. So, of course, I think we talk about now that the Finnish and Swedish situation will be better off with with the NATO membership but I think NATO would be stronger as well with Sweden and, and Finland joining NATO and that's also perhaps relevant for all the other members of NATO to actually have that in the equation and hopefully that also plays a part in the end. Sir. Go ahead. Like um, uh, one hour ago or two hours ago, Mr. Timmerman said on the panel, you know, he said Putin cannot cut off gas to EU member states without hurting himself. Nevertheless, he has done so. He has done so in the case of Poland, in the case of Bulgaria, and now in the case of Finland. So where is the truth? Is it just, you know, what he did? Was it just symbolic because you are relatively small customers? Or where is the truth? Can he cut? Do, do you think he can cut off gas to the EU member state or not? Or maybe to sounds, some? Sounds like a... An e e economics minister, finance minister should answer that. I would argue that he has done a lot that we didn't think he would do. Uh, so I think th there has to be a, an option for him, uh, and there is an option. It would cost Russia a lot to do it, but, uh, but of course he could do it, and I think we should be prepared. That's why we're working very hard in Europe to, 
to, to repower EU, to actually uh, have a stronger uh, energy cooperation, not only in Europe, but also with international partners, but also to increase the pace in the transition. So um, I, I wouldn't say no to the question, uh, but uh, perhaps it would cost him too much. I don't know. Maybe you want to, to add to this uh, issue that you can cut the gas actually only once, because after that, that you have also cut the trust that it, you could deliver it in, in all conditions in the, in the future. And that leads countries, of course, to, to build and choose other energy systems and other, uh, other, other so providers there's a bigger, of energy. there's a bigger price than he may even there, realize. There is a big price because this is a major change, of course, yeah. then in the ener energy system. When you once cut the pipeline, that's it. Who, who, who relies after that to the... And, and one other thing to it, he cannot deliver the gas to someone else in a short period of time. So the gas will be worthless. He couldn't transform it to Asia uh, or somewhere else in a right. short period of time. So it will be uh, stop. It will be not sold anywhere else. Yeah. Uh, my name is Adi Femi Akintanya. I'm with Arise News. It's a small Nigerian network. Uh, but my question is actually about Turkey. Their hesitation for Finland and Sweden to join NATO has been quite strong. And though not to underestimate the power of conversation and negotiation, it seems as though their, their, their dismay at the prospect of you joining NATO was quite strong. So what has changed? I understand that um, Foreign Minister Chavisholu has confirmed, and you've already said that starting tomorrow there will be a delegation in Ankara, but it, is it just conversation that has made Turkey go from saying you, the both of your countries harbor PKK terrorists, as they call them, to just, well, if we have a conversation, everything will be smoothed out. Do you have PKK representatives in your country or not? But as I, as I said, we have a very strict rules on, on any terrorist uh, acts or any terrorist preparations in our country, and we take very seriously uh, those limitations and, and rules that are put also by European European Union. That's very, very clear. Uh, on other issues, of course, if, if there are any uh, re requests of individual citizens or something like that, then we follow our rule of law uh, practices. Our juridical system is, is very clear on, on, on this issue. But I, I, I think this is also, this of course, a question to Finland and Sweden, but this is also a question to NATO. Is is the uh, NATO open door policy valid or not? If there comes a moment when the open door uh, policy is no more valid, that's a big change also in the NATO. Do you have anything to add on that? No, I, uh, I think it's very hard to speculate uh, about the motives because we got signals in the beginning in the process before we, uh, we went for, for application, had positive signals. So what changed in between, I don't know. Uh, so for us taking this uh, uh, concern seriously, we should. Uh, we, we should do our homework uh, and hopefully that could, could resolve the situation. But I also think that other NATO countries see the benefits of Sweden and Finland being part of it. And perhaps that also plays a part. So it's very hard to say, but it's not the first time that there have been these kind of processes in different uh, uh, sets, uh, forums. So, so we'll see. Anyone else? Um, I think we're, we have time for maybe one more question, if someone has one. Um, let, let me ask you both then, um, it feels like this is going to, this conflict is going to go on for a long time. Um, the economic crisis that comes out of it seems like it's only going to spread. Um, food crisis, because Ukraine is the breadbasket of the world. Um, are we in a, I mean, as, you know, you're a finance minister, are you, what kind of world do you imagine we're going into for the next few years? Because it feels like it's going to be high energy prices, food crises all over the world, presumably then migration crises that come out of that, those food crises. It feels like a very different world than the last three years. It is a different world and it's more dangerous, it's more unsecure, but it depends on what's happening, both in the war, what Russia actually does, uh, in Ukraine, uh, how it continues, but also how, how we help Ukraine now. They have a lot of harvest that actually could be brought to market. How do we help them with that so they also get their income f from what they have done so far? But also, what can we do in the international, uh, on the energy side? We already talked about it in Europe and, and with international partners. And then also, how 
international actors act now when it comes to trade, when it comes to food, for instance. We know when countries actually make export uh, 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 restrictions, the prices are going up. So this is what's happening in some countries around the world. So we have to also have an international uh, debate and discussion on how to handle the situation so we don't increase inflation and create problems for ourselves. Final thoughts on this? No, I, I think, of course, this is a global crisis now vis-a-vis -vis the energy prices and, and, and food security issues and others. And I, I met here also several African Mm. ministers and of course this is a major major concerns what's go what's going on and how this is influencing to the stability of those countries and, and this is maybe something again a little bit unpredictable consequences of this crisis or how to get the, the food products out of Ukraine and, and mm. the ship shipping and, and so forth should be organized and, and I, I, I have also the feeling that all this happened very rapidly in a couple of months time but to fixing this <laughs> will take a long long time and, and, and maybe trying to look different solutions. But of course, what is uh, obvious is that when we, when we look, for example, the voting in the UN, more than 140 countries, you know, condemning what Russia has been doing. So, so at least the understanding is there that the major, major rules, global rules has been violated and that there has been a strong global reaction. Mm. One, one big unpredictable element of this could be that Russia invades Finland. Do you think that's a serious prospect and are you prepared? Well, we have always, of course, uh, due to our history, been prepared uh, for that. But we have been prepared for the military action, we have been prepared for uh, a violation of our airspace, our land, our territory. We have been prepared for actually cyber and, and hybrid threats and, 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 and so forth. And, so forth. And, and that has been, that's in our DNA. And, and that's a part of our, our defense mentality. Whoever wants to, to, uh, to try to harm us will, will face the consequences from our side. And of course, when, when you are a member of European Union, when we look how much solidarity there has already been for Ukraine, which is not a member currently of European Union, how much more solidarity there would be for a country that is attacked, which is a European Union member. And then, of course, the NATO membership would also increase the security. But I also add to that that, that we want also to be the security provider. We are mm. looking also situation in the Baltic states. We are looking at the situation around the Baltic Sea and, and so forth. And I, I'm sure that Finland and Sweden as a NATO members will contribute to the regional security as well. Final question. I think we have enough time. No, I'm sorry. This is they make the rules. Ministers, thank you so much. Pleasure to have thank you. this conversation. Thank you. Thank you.